things I talk about can be backed up by anthropologists as well because these are scientists, not the stuff was conjecture, not the stuff that the uh, uh, colonizers, because a lot of the stuff, you know, that was talked about was the bad guys, you know. I mean, when have you ever seen the victims tell their story? Most of the information we have is the bad people explaining basically the, the Native American culture. Native Americans fairly rarely, the information we have is not from a Native American perspective. So since I actually know, been to, and live, my, my mother and father live right down the road from the reservation, of course, my family bought land on the reservation. So, I mean, bought land that's been in our family since before the 1700s, since forever. And uh, so I guess it was purchased a long time ago. We still have to pay in the Commonwealth of Virginia, we still have to pay uh, personal property taxes on the land. So a lot of times what we do in our family is when a senior person, for example, my aunt, she died. And so I was able to purchase a large portion of ancestral land uh, from her. But essentially, that still family land has been in my branch. Now, again, what a lot of times people don't realize, I see a lot of people say, well, the Native Americans had slaves. And I just want to let you know, since 1619, Africans have been in Jamestown from 1619. And even before that, I was talking yesterday about Don, D-O-N, that's a title, Don, as in Lord or Duke or Earl, Lewis. He came from Mexico, and he was actually here in Virginia before the Jamestown colonists got here, interfacing with the Tentumokas and married into them. Now, we don't know exactly who he is. Some people think that Opan Chancano is his son. Some people think that Don Lewis is Opan Chancano. And then other people think, you know, a lot of, that somehow they're kin or Somehow, Wahan Sinoka, or King Powhatan, befriended this gentleman, Don Luis, who taught them about the fire sticks, who taught them about the English that, and, or the Europeans that was coming, the strange things, because Don Luis was originally in Mexico also. So it was a lot of traveling of the Mexicans and the, the Spanish, I should say, and the Portuguese as well as they were scouting this land way before Captain John Smith and the Jamestown colony was started. That's why the English knew that they wanted to start a colony here because they had already um, <clears throat> they had already um, calculated that there was more land further north, and it was just a matter of finding a, a, a decent area for a settlement, you know, that they could settle. And it just so happened that um, John Roth, Sir Walter Raleigh with various noble people with the London Company. It was a company in London called the London Company. And what they did was they basically purchased North America from Europe without ever being in North America before. They just, uh, or consenting with the natives that was there or anything. They just basically came there and said, okay, this is gonna be ours. That's all to it. And that's how I go. So. Um, I just want to let people know that that's the backdrop um, with, in which all of this is happening. And these poor Tacinica Mochas found themselves the first North American continent natives to interface with the British. And the British was one of the most powerful European countries. They probably was, they had already defeated the Spanish, who was very powerful. Uh, they were just as maritime as the Portuguese in terms of traveling by, by ocean, so they really knew how to get around. So these were very, very capable European people that these natives found themselves up against. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start in, and I'm gonna start painting, and at the same time, I'm gonna try my best. I'm gonna try my best to, um, to talk about the history as well. So. Again, if anybody wants to add in something, I mean, I don't have to be the definitive person on this. I can have people join my live, or I can have, uh, you know, anybody who wants to join in to kind of give their opinion, especially if we have some people from Virginia that might know some of the Virginia history. That would be great to uh, be able to add that in. So 
Uh, I don't mind that, and I will allow that if somebody wanted to uh, DM me or whatever and, and actually come into the live. So what I'm going to start doing, so I'm going to start painting in on some of the bad guys. And I'm going to start out with this guy here, which is John Roth which I have John Roth basically um, with the knife to uh, Pocahontas' or to Matoaka's throat. Uh, he's not a good guy. He's not very good at all. Uh, John Roth, basically, his family uh, walks around, you know, they became governors. They became people who ran basically the country. Um, even today, a lot of uh, John Roth descendants are people that's in politics, both state politics as well as uh, federal politics. And um, and some of the, uh, what they call the original or the, uh, the the founding families. And it's it's amazing that these people came the founding families of the country. And in reali reality, they were very ruthless. For example, even after Opan Chicana was defeated in 1647, um, there was no more help that the natives could have. Basically, their strongest um, warrior, their strongest military person, was gone. His warriors was basically defeated, gone. And then that's when the British, uh, the, the so-called colonies, coloners, showed their real colors. They really had no, uh, they really had no um, concern really at all to, to be friendly to them. They only wanted to be friendly as long as the, the natives had the upper hand. As long as the natives could inflict some serious harm on them, they wanted peace. But the second there was no more Opet Chanakano, all of a sudden, they started to do a lot of diabolical things. One of the first things they did in 1647 was this doctor. It was a doctor in the Jamestown colony. He also, guess what? He was also a preacher. And what he did was he invited all of the uh, Wessel Lawrences, all of the chiefs of the various tribes. Now, you got to remember this, 31 tribes. And then there was other affiliate tribes that... Basically, they were natives. It didn't matter which tribe they were. It wasn't matter if they was the Senecamoka or the independent uh, tribe of the Senecamoka. It didn't matter. If they were a different culture, if they was Native American, they had to go. The cultures just was not blending. Um, the natives did not understand ownership of property. And they were used to basically picking up their, um, their homes, their, 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 their villages, and then when the soil was depleted, because they were primarily farmers, they were also hunters and fishermen, but whenever that area was depleted, they simply moved to another area. But the area was their domain, but it was shared amongst all of the natives equally. They really didn't understand that a settler was on this property, and then they came to the properties that they always have been accessible to them, and then all of a sudden, the, um, the settlers was uh, basically telling them to leave the property or else they would be willing to kill. So a lot of the Tsinica Mokas after Opek Chanakano died, he was shot in the back by a guard of the person who took Captain John Smith's uh, position. And also, in, in, in before that, he was flaunted in front of his own people, which is something that a that that a pre, that, that the um, premier West of Warrants or something that the the paramount West of Warrants, which he was, he took a Wahan Sonoka's place, um, and they would never. When he captured John Smith, Opet Chanakano, Chanakano captured John Smith once before, and John Smith offered him some inkies and trinkets he had on him. John Smith had hundreds of arrows in him. But because he had so much armor on, because he had so thick clothes on, the arrows didn't really mortally wound him. <clears throat> Therefore, uh, Captain John Smith was able to survive that particular attack 
without really even needing a whole lot of repairs because he spent a lot of time under the, under the care of Opec Chanakano. And what happened was um, Wahan Tanoka asked uh, Opec Chanakano to bring John Smith to him because John Smith had, in, uh, the, the settlers had inflicted fear in the natives. Now, yes, Wahan Tanoka was a tough guy. Opec Chancano was a tough guy too. But the, the natives feared these English because they killed very, very readily. And they had such, uh, they had such, um, <clears throat> such intense uh, in what they considered to be magical tools of death. Um, the cannons and the swords and the shields and the breastplates the natives considered those to be magical tools of death because they were used to kill them. They just didn't, they knew about them because of um, Don Luis had taught them about those things. They called them fire sticks. I mean, that's what would be the English translation of the words that they use. But however, the average native basically was in fear and basically they ran. Basically, Wahan Sanoka became more important because they said, okay, who can save us from these uh, invaders? Who can save us from them? Um, because they're just going into our, our villages and just destroying us, you know, um, without any reserve for our lives at all. So that made people like o o Opec Chanakano and Wahan Sanoka very, which were very tough warriors. So even if they were not part of their confederation, even if there was a tribe that wasn't part, because you have to remember, intermixed in their territory, and now we're talking all the way from Massachusetts all the way, uh, well, not necessarily, but basically the Virginia area, the Eastern Virginia area, intermixed in their territory were other independent tribes like the Rappahannock and the, uh, the Appomattox. These tribes were independent. They never came under the subjugation of Wahan Sanoka until the English arrived. And then when the English arrived, uh, these people start saying, hold on now. Um, <laughs> these people are not just killing, they don't, they can't tell one native tribe from the next tribe. They're not just killing uh, Powhatan's people. They're killing all of us. What are we gonna do? So what happened was they all start joining slowly Put, it, put aside their differences because these tribes had differences. They, the, the various Wessel Warrenses, and the Wessel Warrens was just any leader, was any leader of any particular tribe. Every single tribe, whether they be the Powhite tribe or the Matapanai or the Pomonkey, Pomonkey and Matapanai were the most populated tribes. That's why they still survive today. They just had enough population to deal with all of the decimation. And even now, it's only on the reservation, there's only about 8,000 left. Uh, that's because most of the people, like myself, became, my family, became renegade. In other words, they simply left because they just couldn't, they left the reservation because they couldn't make a living. They just couldn't survive uh, on the reservation because they had kept passing laws that that they couldn't fish, they couldn't sell. You, matter of fact, no common person other than a royal or a, what they still had non-common people. In other words, aristocracy, English aristocracy. They were the people who ran this whole thing. This thing went straight to the king. That's why it was important to Christianize people to follow certain rules. That's why it was important to have Matoaka because you had to have somebody, in order for the, the, the London company which is John Roth to do everything they needed. They needed to say, okay, this is royalty. She represents the king over here. And we need to, you need to negotiate with the king. You need to negotiate with Wahan Sanoka. In reality, what the king of England was negotiating with was John Roth and, and John Smith. And certain um, people, certain business people that was here Basically, they were trying to get into the good, they were trying to get into the, uh, the upper society of England. That's what they were really trying to do, and they were trying to do that through making it look like 
Okay, you guys gonna get rich with us, just like Cortez got rich in Mexico. And if you follow what we're doing, just like they, they convinced a lot of the natives in Mexico that they was actually Spaniards. And what they were trying to do here was the same thing. They were trying to convince the natives that you are in fact not a native. You can be a good English person as long as you come in subjugation to our king. So they tried to get Wuhan Sinoka to actually be crowned the king of Virginia. Or, or, or they didn't even call it Virginia. I think it was called Elizabeth City. It wasn't really even a, a real name to the place, but they wanted him to be the king of the place. And through by John Roth marrying Matoaka, because they found out that that was the culture of the people, he would actually marry just like they tried to do in England. That's how they tried to marry into the English royalty. He would literally be on an equal standing point with the, with the upper aristocracy of England. Same thing with Captain John Smith. But what happened was this whole plan of, of John Roth and a lot of these people in the colony almost backfired in their face. And I believe that they say Pocahontas got sick of uh, probably the, the diseases that killed the Native Americans. Now, I know there's the whole story that the Native Americans, there was a lot of diseases, but one part of me don't believe that the diseases killed the Native Americans because there are so many laws that said that a colonial person could kill a Native American on site. I, and the fact that the Native Americans had stone arrows with stone tips, they had uh, rawhide shields, they had uh, stone arrows, stone spears, and wooden and rock tomahawks against muskets and cannons and, and hardened uh, steel breastplates. I mean, these people, the English had steel breastplates. It wasn't just iron. So uh, it was very hard for the Native Americans to actually kill an Englishman if he was fully if he was fully dressed out in full uh, English battle armor, these people, just like Cortez, it became very difficult to actually kill them. And so you had to be an exceptional warrior to be actually able to, 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 to make some kills. And the only way that they could actually deal with the English was through guerrilla warfare. They, they, they learned, and that was where Opak Chancano and Don Lewis, who was probably most likely an African man from Africa, probably uncut by way of Mexico. But originally he was from Africa. He spent some time in, in, um, in Europe and in, in, in basically Spain. He didn't spend time in uh, England. He spent time in Spain where he learned languages. He learned the culture, he was educated. Uh, and he had somewhat of a formal education. That's why he was called Don Luis. He was, the only, the only problem with Don Luis, the reason why he didn't go down well in Mexico, the reason that he got put in slavery because he probably thought too much of himself. And what happened was he got on a voyage and he ended up on the east coast of Virginia, of what was to become Virginia. Um, so, who else was with Don Lewis? Did he just come by himself? How many other African people was with Don Lewis? This is something that's never, never pursued amongst the historians as a possibility. Um, they don't really pursue the idea that there could have been African people already in Virginia before the English showed up. They only pursue the idea that when the English showed up, there was only the Tsenekamoka here. The Tsenekamoka had no relationship with anybody else but the English. And I don't believe that's true. And based on the way the people look in this area, I'm just saying, just the way people look, I know the families. I know the old families. Okay, I know about the new families that came after the 19 whatever. Even the people that came after the 18s. We know about those families in Mango Heck, along the York River, along the Pamunkey River. That's, 
I go out there all the time and I go to my, my property. I have property in Henrico County, but I also have property in, in, my, uh, in, in King William County, where a lot of this, what a lot of the original stuff happened was, King, was called New Kent. Back in the old days, there was no county called King William. Every time there was a different king, there was King James, they would name the James River after him. Then there was King William, they will name a county King William. Then there was King George, then what that was called uh, George, Prince, Prince George County, you know? <laughs> king and Queen County, you know? It was constantly trying to, the colonial British was constantly trying to get the good graces of the, the English people who lived in England, in London primarily. So the reason they left because there was a nobody. <laughs> Basically, there were nobody. There, there was a somebody who wanted to be, who was a nobody who wanted to be a somebody. Let's put it that way. In England. So what they were doing was they was coming to the New World, so they could be, so they could get land. So because back in those days, you were not rich unless you owned land. I mean, today you could just have a large banking account. And if you have a large banking account, you're considered wealthy. In those days, you could have a large banking account and somebody could come just take it away from you. If they had a, a, a military, they could just come take it. So having a large bank account didn't mean anything. But now if you, they could take your land, but a lot of times the people, the local people lived on the land of a, of a, a person who was aristocracy. So they might have been thousands of people, so it was easy for a person who was considered uh, an aristocrat to get the local people to join him when people came in to uh, take the land because they were in good graces with this particular lord, that's what they call themselves, literally, and because they were in good graces, they felt like they would always be able to farm the land in England. This is in England. And then in addition to farming the land in England, they would be able to uh, prosper uh, with the produce of, of, the, of the property. They were given a chance to make some money, let's put it that way, with the produce of the property of the land. So um, they came to the new world with that exact idea of wealth. And the whole idea was to get land and the people who was all over the land that didn't have any concept really who really just didn't understand the idea that you could own land and that would be your land and nobody else could deal with it and you had complete control over who came on that land or didn't come on that land that was completely a a english idea and what the tacitica mocha did not understand was that so whenever they walked on a colonial's land now there was no attack. All they had to do was just walk onto that to the land that somebody had made a claim to with the, the new government that they sat in place. Then that person could petition to whoever, and basically he had the rights to kill that person for, for, for trespassing. The whole idea of trespassing is a European concept. It was never a Tsenica Mocha concept or even in, when they went to, um, let's just say, in Africa, West Africa, I don't believe they had those concepts at all there as well. I believe that um, basically people could just kind of move to a certain area and live and live a decent life and raise their cattle or raise their crops and migrate from place to place without any deeds of ownership. I mean, <laughs> you know, and paying taxes on land those concepts still are not necessarily the most popular concepts in many West African cultures, as well as amongst, uh, well, native people have their own way of dealing with that, with their people, depending on which tribe and how much they've been anglicized through the years. Now you gotta remember what happened was there was a, con uh, a campaign on the natives to get them to be more British. And the way you did that, one of the primary ways you did that was you Christianized them. And then once they were Christianized, you would intermarry with some of them, or whoever was left. And most of the time, 
The person you were going to intermarry with was a woman. The man was going to be killed. And the woman, you know, uh, you basically had her hostage. I mean, just kind of like Sally Hemings was with Thomas Jefferson. I mean, what choice did Sally... I don't believe that Sally Hemings with Thomas Jefferson. I do not believe that her half-sister, they say her half-sister was her half-sister. I believe her half-sister was her full sister because they're from Virginia. And Thomas Jefferson, before he lived in the Monticello area, which is the mountainous area around the Shenandoah Valley, before he moved there, he was from this area. He was from the York River area, the Tidewater area, the area where a lot of rivers and bays were. And what he did was he moved to Monticello where he could basically do whatever he wanted. He could go out there and by this point, um, the, and Thomas Jefferson actually knows a lot about the original natives. The original natives during the time of Thomas Jefferson, many of them were still, um, you know, uh, had their tribes going. A lot of tribes, I mean, we only have two officially recognized tribes, but these tribes were still together. Now, what made, uh, so out of about 30 some tribes, by the time you get to the time of Thomas Jefferson, you might have had a, about a half a dozen or so tribes still existing, still basically uh, trying to survive in a European environment. And basically the main thing that happened to these people was slowly over time, slowly, 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 they became absorbed into the, uh, to the English environment of English people. And again, they intermarried with the English. And of course, the, uh, in order to buy or sell, they passed all these laws. So in order to do anything where you could sustain your family or take care of your family, you had to speak English and you had to have an English name. So that's how they basically destroyed all of the identity of the uh, Native American person. And as a matter of fact, if you use the Native American language, you were a uh, suspect to be perhaps even taken to court and punished and or perhaps even killed. And depending on how nice the person was <laughs> who caught you doing that. Uh, now, that doesn't mean like in certain families, privately, uh, Native American families, that doesn't mean that they still did not use their language in certain phrases and certain words. And they did not stop naming their children uh, at least one of the names. Most of the time it was a middle name. It's a Native American name. That doesn't mean that. But most of the time what they would do is disguise the, the middle name or the extra name. In other words, they would have, okay, on your official document, say that your, your name is this. And it's just your middle name. But amongst us, we're going to call you something completely different because that's how they survive. And then over time, this people say, well, I, this is my nickname. They don't, you know, people make up nicknames all the time, like Poochie and things like that. And people just start forgetting the meaning of these, the, the names of the words. So they had uh, <laughs> a name that might have been native, one of their names. And they said, for, for some reason, uh, my grandfather was named this name. And my, my, my mother decided to name me also this name. But... I don't know. I don't know the meaning of the name. They never explained it to me. And then perhaps because they were going to schools with the uh, with the colonial people, and they just didn't want them to risk being heard speaking the native language, and then there could have been some type of uh, repercussion. I mean, you can see that certain things happen now uh, in schools uh, where people can't wear, you know, for example, uh, their own dreadlocks or braided hair or even in certain places. So you can imagine if people had their own native hairstyles back then or if people had their own um, <clears throat> if people had their own um, <clears throat> uh, if people had their own um, uh, you know hairstyle or customs you know coming in those were um, I, those were positions of suspect. And, uh, and a lot of times, if they got hit once, if a Native American, 
I don't know how brown they were, but generally if they got hit once with uh, intermarrying with a person that was British, especially if there was a very fair complexion British person, say with blonde hair and blue eyes and stuff, um, they could still look like a, a, a normal British person with dark hair and dark eyes. And, um, and then that next generation basically was a, from that point on, that next generation might have been just considering themselves British. And in many ways, a lot of the old families forgot, the old, old native families forgot who they were. Now, the difference is with a lot of African people, and I know they tell the story to Africa that, that natives had slaves. Now, what you don't realize is that not only were African people getting enslaved, like during Bacon's Rebellion, you can see how this started to happen. This, this, the Africans were saying, hey, look, there's two nations here. There's the British nation. This is what the Africans were saying. And then there's the native nation. And what the British nation is going to do is enslave me. They're going to, they're going to make, force me to work against my will. And um, the other nation is going to allow me to hunt and live free and intermarry with their people. And uh, so um, I think I'm going to join the natives. Now, what happened was they'll go join the natives. And a lot of times people said they had slaves. No, they didn't. When a, when a white person came and showed up onto these people's property, and was nothing they could do to stop a white person from showing up on native property and say, okay, how about, you know, because they, you know, you had people that was gone and they was hunting black folks. You know, they were called, um, what were they called? They were called um, slave catchers, you know, <laughs> whatever they were. They were people who basically, uh, if a slave ran away, they would go and capture that person. There was a lot of money. Slaves were worth, to, what, what today would be millions of dollars. Literally, it'd be like having a robot. I mean, if you could afford a robot, it was only for the aristocracy. It was only for the very wealthy. It was not something for regular colonial people. They couldn't afford that. And so they would say that, that the colonials were indentured servants, and, uh, and that's not true. There was no indentured servitude. There was some indentured servitude to pay for their trip. And what they were trying to do is they were paying for their trip uh, to the new world. And once they paid that off, because the whole idea, how you doing, Stacy? Stacy uh, AC, <laughs> I mean, Tyreen AC, I'm sorry. And uh, Shelly Alich, uh, uh, I can't pronounce that, I'm sorry. And Del Monte Cow, what's up? How y'all doing? So, anyway, um, so there were African people here before Jamestown, before Captain John Smith, before 1807. In 1590s, there was African people here because John Lewis was here. And who knows who else came when he got here. And he could speak Spanish. He probably could also speak English. And that's where, and he was also affiliated with Wahan Sanoka. He could have been, Wahan Sanoka could have made him as a brother. Now when they made you as a brother, they did not see you as African, and I'm native, the Native Americans didn't understand prejudice. So oftentimes if an African person came to live with them, the white people showed up on the plantation saying, that slave is a runaway. Prove to me that he's not a runaway. So they had to be documented, documented as their slaves by the English. Now, the Native Americans didn't have any concept of slaves. They did have a concept of uh, enemy and friend. They didn't have any concepts of slaves. So, but what happened was the uh, whites did have that concept. And what they did was they, uh, they had to produce documents to say, okay, this person was probably married most likely to one of their daughters or sons. And in order for the English not to pick them up, they have to have paperwork to say, this person is part of our, this person's a slave because there was no way 
during that time that an African person was going to just walk around for free without actually purchasing that freedom somehow. There was no way that was going to happen. The only way that was going to happen, you had to show ownership. Okay, now that's just how it was. So I know it's easy for people nowadays to read certain documents and misinterpret those documents. But you got to remember, Native Americans did not understand contracts and documents that way. And then instead of having to give their family member over to the English, they just said, look, we're going to comply with you because we know what you're going to do. If we don't comply with you, you're just going to come in and, and jack us up anyway and take them anyway. So what's going to happen is we got to show the paperwork. We have to show that this person is actually our property. So yes, if you go back in, in, in hindsight and you look at the documents, it looks like the Native Americans owned African people. But the reality is these people were their family members. These people were people that they were just trying to protect from going into slavery because they realized right away that if you was brown, and some of the natives were brown too, and they were intermarrying, and the children were brown. So it didn't take but one generation. It didn't take but, you know, you get married, nine months later you have a child. Three or four or five years later, the child's running around looking like an African person, looking like Barack Obama. So it did not take that long before uh, you have a whole bunch of people that don't look as native anymore. They look kind of African because what they're doing is they're intermixing with you. But you know, you know their mother, you know their father, you know their grandmother was native. So the native people knew that this was the case. And so what happens is if you were a person on a reservation or if you was a person who owned some land because, and you generally you were going to own ancestral land that you already own because, again, they already, the land was considered already theirs. But the English had done a very good job of convincing the natives and enforcing and enforcing ownership. They did a very good job. So the natives understood the only way we could continue to fish and hunt and farm the way we always have, the only way we can do that and not get killed is we must comply. We must comply with their rules because if we don't, and they were a nation based on rules. And that's one of the things that English always maintained. And I believe they always maintained that because they were always a country of conquest. So they would stand behind that as a way to persecute the people who they, you know, they, they, the people that, that language, that country that they came into, that was a way to basically keep them in subjugation, saying, look, we got a record right here. And our record says that this is what's going on. So they kept really, really good records. Now, because they kept such good records, we know exactly of their atrocities. Because oftentimes the records they kept was to support the persecution of another person. Whether that was uh, uh, in Africa or in the New World, the records they kept was usually kept uh, to continue the subjugation of other people, the peoples that they invaded. So um, you have um, a situation where these people are becoming invaded and um, they're being, new rules are thrusted on them that they don't even fully understand. And so they were owning African people on record. But the, the practical reality is and you can go see these families today, and you can, you can see uh, that they always, they look, some of them look black, they're straight up African. But they're Native American families, and they were never, ever slaves. How do you think they were never slaves? Uh, do you think they actually really did buy their own freedom? No. Uh, they were Native Americans who kept intermarrying with the slaves. If they had to go all the way north, did every slave have to go all the way north to get the escape to their freedom? No. You could just escape 10, 15, 20 miles away 
and join the natives and become free. And you think African people didn't know that? Yes, they did. They knew that. They knew, okay, I know the way to get free. Uh, I saw some natives right over there. And I saw a black person with them behaving just like they would want to, want to, you know, a native. And what I found out is that black person was actually one of their family members. And, you know, I'm going to run away to there because I think that's a better place for me than where I am. So you had that happening quite a bit uh, in the state of Virginia. That was happening more often than not. And a lot of times people know of several classes. Now, these are the classes that the whites invented just for themselves. We're not even talking about the mix that was happening between Native American and black. Let's talk about the mix that was happening between white and black, because that was also happening. You had a group called uh, Mulatto, and a lot of people are familiar with that particular term, but they don't realize it was another group of people called Tawny. <laughs> T-A-W-N-Y. And those were people who were very white. I mean, they could almost pass. I mean, if you was to look at them, you would swear that they're straight from England somewhere. But they knew that that person, by knowing the history of that family, they knew that that person actually was, uh, had some African in them. And so the person who was a mulatto was just the person who was hit. He could still look, the mulatto could still look very, very African looking like somebody like Barack Obama. A mulatto could still, uh, he could also, a mulatto could look almost white too. But what they had was another category called Tani. And what Tani meant was these people are generationally you know, one, one mulatto mixed with another mulatto, mixed with another mulatto, mixed with a Native American, mixed with a white, mixed with a whoever. And it started to get kind of complex. As you remember, these people have been here since the, uh, since the 1600s. They had a long time to mix, a long time. And it don't take but, uh, you know, you get reached to the age of 13, 14. Back then, that was the age that most people started reproducing. It's not like now when you're at 28 years old, <laughs> you're just starting to have your babies. No, uh, back then at 13, you was making a family. You was basically making a family at 13. So the bottom line is that uh, it didn't take but about 30 years for you to have two generations of mixed people. And the British people are steadily getting off the ships coming here and finding that, oh, look at these people who are not even British with all this land and they're making a lot of money and they're already wealthy. They don't have to work. They're not going into any kind of indentured servitude. They're already wealthy. And some of them look African and some of them look native. So there became a lot of um, strife it became a lot of um it became a lot of um the, that's when racism started getting organized because these new uh british that was coming were peasants they were serfs they were people called serfs in europe they were the bottom and they had come here so they could get a chance to be the top only to find out that the top people were brown people <laughs> They weren't even British even. And at least over in England, the people that was, was jacking us up look kind of like us. These people don't even look like us. So they, what they start doing is once they got enough population, because what you have to remember is they taught the natives well. They taught the Africans also well on how to live like a, uh, like a British. And so these people had, and when you see like uh, there were certain people in the House of Burgess, for example, of, of Richmond, I mean, of, of, of Virginia. This was one of the first governments before there was even a government. There was something called a House of Burgess. This was before they had anything in Pennsylvania. Too much to talk about. And they were African people. They were brown looking people. They were native looking people. They were mixed of different kinds. It wasn't just one, it was all different kinds of looks of people. 
This is why you see it. I'm explaining why you see that. The phenomena that made this stuff start happening. So uh, this is what happened in the state of Virginia quite often. And what happened was once enough British population got here, they would arm together. And this is still happening today. It's called Republicans and Democrats. And it is not based on calling being called a Republican and Democrat. It's basically one group against the next. Is you look at the geography, you look at the people. Don't look at what they call themselves because they flop parties. They're always going to be two parties. It could be called party one and party two. It doesn't matter what the party is called. There's a party of brown people that consists of more mixed, diverse people. And then there's a party of people who consist of only British oriented or European oriented people. And that's one thing I think is kind of missing from the equation nowadays. People are not figuring that out. <laughs> They're just not. They just said, oh, it don't matter which party, blah, 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 blah. Well, it, it's not the party. It's, it's who is going to sympathize with you. If you're a group of people like Wahan Sanoka, you have a certain amount of power. But your enemy also has power. You must give up something. You must negotiate you give up something and you get something. You keep giving, and what you're actually doing is, it's not as like you're governing yourself, because you can't, because these people are here and you cannot drive them out. So what you do is you do your best you can to keep your people from getting jacked up. So that's what a lot of people did. They did the best they could to keep their people, knowing that all these people were constantly flowing in from Europe to kind of keep what they have had historically for a long time and also to keep their people from getting killed. And what happened was they started getting outpopulated, not by birth, not because they were having less babies, because the English could just keep coming over on those ships. And that's what the London company was good at doing. They said it doesn't matter if we got these people over here that can, that can vote and get in power. We'll just continue to send over more and more British. And then when they get over, they're going to get, you know, become a governor and get power. And then what you start doing is subjugating those uh, original people that's there. Because we've taught them how to do our system. We taught them our system. And they're following the system. They understand the system now. The system is becoming theirs. And, uh, and that's basically what happened. And uh, in order to master that system, you had to go to, the, they had the College of William and Mary that they invented, and they encouraged Native Americans and Africans, by the way, freed Africans, to join so that they could learn how to speak and be lawyers and participate in the system. Now, was it beneficial for these people to participate in the system? Yes. It was beneficial to participate in the system because if you didn't, most of the time you ended up going the way of Opec Chancano. Chancano. That's the way you went. You simply became a, a savage. You were an enemy. You were uncivilized. Therefore, you must die. Kind of like what you see happening on the streets today. The guy sitting out there in his, own, in his home turf. Police roll up on him. The guy doesn't want to comply. The next thing you know, he's tased to death or shot. <laughs> you know? That's basically what's happening. Today. It's not really that different than what's happening today. That's what happened to the Native Americans. They were just sitting there chilling, doing what they always have done in their little hood, their village, whatever you want to call it. And uh, they were kind of intimidating to somebody. You know, grouping the little too groupy and, you know, their lifestyle was different. And so what happened was they came, there was a conflict, and somebody died. <clears throat> they came, there was a complex, somebody died. Came, con conflict, somebody died. So when people came to the reservation to see if this person was actually, in fact, uh, property <laughs> of the Native American, because an uh, African person at that time simply could not buy his freedom. It just didn't get that it didn't get that 
It didn't get that organized. Essentially at that time is the guy with the gun was dictating and the majority of the people was the, the majority of the people was ruling. You know, we call it democracy. And that basically meant that mostly English people were there. And if they said, look, uh, there's a lot of stuff here to get. And we don't want you to get it. We want to get it. And what we have, we want to do is we want to uh, we want to pass some laws that's going to make it hard for you to get land, become rich, because you again you had to have money to get rich back then. You had to have land, not money. You, yeah, if you was going to raise tobacco and send it to Europe and exchange it for say gold or whatever, because that's what they had back then. They had gold and silver, not paper money like we had today. Gold and silver was one way to hold your money in place, to hold your wealth in place. So it was not as much population as it is today. And there was enough gold around to be distributed in such a way that, um, that um, you could exchange gold for various uh, items that you needed. And what happened was people would come with it, they would earn a certain amount of first copper, then they earn a certain amount of silver, and then they could, uh, if they was from the lower ranks, they could actually purchase some land. And if you were a lord already from England, the king just simply awarded you before you even left England X amount of land in X place because there was generally one of his guys there, one of his administrators already in the New World, who basically, they would see the seal of the king and say, okay, you get this tract of land that this guy saw. He's already excavated this. He's already made a map of it. Who cares if some natives is living on it? But you are my cousin or you're my distant relative or you're somebody that I like, I favor. Therefore, that land is yours because you're from the aristocracy. You're from the uh, ruling class. Okay, and so you did have some class structure where the poor English, the poor English was feeling left out the game because on the one side of the equation, they weren't the aristocracy. On the other side of the equation, they weren't an original native. On the other side of the equation, there was Africans here joining the natives and becoming part of them who got land. And there started to become some resentment. There started to become some serious issues. Some serious issues started to develop. And these uh, white colonials said, we didn't give up everything we had in, in, in Europe to come here to be on the bottom again. We just didn't do that. We're not going, we're not going to uh, subjugate ourselves to that. What we're going to do is we're going to change these laws. And we're going to change these laws so we have a chance. And so we're going to make it so that if you was African, if you was a certain color, uh, you will be considered Negro or colored. And if you were, uh, uh, or if you're a certain color, you will be considered white. In other words, there was no distinction where you could be native. You either, if you were a native, you was gonna either, if you look too brown, you was be going to be, they changed the law that you was going to either become Negro or either you was going to become a colonial or white. What we call white today, they call back then a colonial uh, or a British. And it all had to do with um, how you looked. <laughs> it really, it came down to, do you look like us that's coming from England? because we are the ones who want to come here and have a good future. And we don't want to sit there and compete with you. What we want to do is be able to come here and be able to get some land and be able to prosper. We want to be, uh, 
aristocracy. Everybody wanted to go up. Everybody wanted to become the ruling class. Nobody wanted to be a serf anymore. When they came here to this country, nobody wanted to be a serf. Everybody wanted to be uh, aristocracy. So everybody wanted to be what you call the first family. You'll see this kind of uh, language pop up all the time. First family, first family. And what that simply means is that since we're the first people, I mean, that's the people who became the, um, the Rockefellers. They're the first family in New York City. They were some of the first people in the place we call Manhattan. They took the property from the Manhattan natives and basically claimed it for the Dutch. And because they had a lock on all of the furs and they had a lock on all of the, the timber, which is a lot of money. It's a lot of timber in the New World. Uh, and since they had a lock on that, they made money hand over fist, cutting that stuff down. Again, they didn't cut the stuff down themselves. Guess who they got to do it? They got African people to do it. Because they passed the laws that this person has to be my slave. If this person is my slave, there's no way that they can earn anything for themselves because they're too busy earning for me. So they created a system that um, would allow them to basically be able to, to own these Africans forever. So that every so that no matter who you were, if you look British, you could come here and you could thrive and survive and you simply would get with somebody else who's already here who made some money and that person, if they had favor on you, they would give you some money <laughs> and you would buy an African slave. And so that was the system. That's how it worked. And so the Africans quickly figured out, okay, we were, some of, some of the Africans that was owning property, they already knew how to fight. They already knew how to work with a long gun and a musket. And they had a large family. They had a chance to build up a little small tribe of their own, of African people. You can go to certain areas like Charles City, Virginia, and even my area, uh, King William, and you'll find these very, very strong African families that's always been there. <laughs> You know, now some of the people might not realize it's there it's exactly how long their people have been there, but they've been there a long time. And uh, and uh, they always was people who hunted, who people who uh, was farming. You know, some of the peanut farmers, for example, peanuts turned out to be a major crop. Some of those peanut farmers was African people. And uh, some of those people either purchase land after, you know, after the uh, Civil War, simply because they was doing that before the Civil War. It's just that their land was taken away. That period between the early 1700s, I would even say the early 1700s, and there was about 100 years from about middle to early 1700s to right around the time of, um, of when, 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 when uh, of Nat Turner, and right around the time of uh, people like um, <clears throat> John Brown, these people were, uh, their land was getting confiscated. And these were people who always have owned their own land. And all of a sudden, the next generation or so with laws changed, they found themselves losing their property somehow through laws that were just insurmountable. You just couldn't, you couldn't deal. So, but that happened, that was not just with the African people of the region. That was also the Native Americans of the region. Now, what happened was, during a trail of tears, they, I saw this post that this guy made that said that they had African slaves. Well, if you was gonna take a person that was worth a lot of money out the area, you had to have a good reason. And they went to Oklahoma. The trail of tears was a march from the east coast of Virginia. That's a long way to walk, basically. I mean, they went by covered wagon because at this point, the natives had become very wealthy. And the African people of Virginia had become very wealthy. But they just found it very difficult 
to hold on to the English system wealth, version of wealth, and not get killed. Because too many English have showed up. And the rules have became so bad, they said, look, I know this is our ancestral land. I know we've been here a long time, but we're just, we're just sick and tired of getting killed. We just don't want to get killed anymore. So what, a lot, what they did was it was called the Trail of Tears. Um, they had to ask permission to leave. They were also encouraged to leave because, again, if you left, you didn't have a claim anymore. And so a lot of times we think that the Native Americans were all killed off because of disease. And I don't believe so. I believe many of them just simply had to get the heck out of Dodge, man. They just had to, they just had to leave. They just could not stay alive and stay where they were. Because there was so much, um, there were so many ways that they could wind up either imprisoned and or killed or a combination. And there were so many ways that they could actually lose their entire wealth. According to this new system, they actually had mastered the system, both the African and the native. So in order for the Africans to actually leave with the natives, they had to classify themselves as property of the natives. That's actually what happened. Um, simply, if they didn't do that, they would not have been able to allow to live, and they would have been pressed into slavery. There was people even up to the time of the Civil War. And I have a family member who was um, a free black. And what happened was, uh, because he was part native and part, part white also, <laughs> The part African, um, he there was a law passed that you couldn't fish because the natives made a lot of their money. They were great fishermen even before the English showed up. And they made a lot of money based on fishing. So what happened was they were still getting wealthy. So what happened was the, uh, and the Africans was joining them. Of course, they were intermarrying with them quite a bit because that was your only option. Other than marrying another African person, your only option was to marry, if you was black, a native person. And so therefore, I say a lot of people that, a lot of black people actually was probably before, and after the Civil War, after everybody was emancipated, everybody started blending again. But I believe that a lot of people that call themselves African today or black are really Native Americans. Um, not necessarily by blood but also possibly by blood, but by, by who they were before the Civil War and who they were even after the Civil War. But after a certain period of time, it just didn't matter because those rules didn't apply anymore. And mostly all people wanted to do was just live in free. They didn't want to be categorized as anything. Uh, they had already lived many, many generations as ambiguous people you know, people without any real connection with Africa, people without any real connection with their own past in terms of being Native Americans, the only thing they had was a connection with the region. Of course, that was now getting taken away. The connection with the region was becoming the land itself was getting coming away. So it was very important for the original planters, and a lot of the original planters in Virginia, especially the more east and south you go, were people of color, and I would say they were also African. As a matter of fact, you can go to a uh, so-called plantation called Yucca. Now, that's an African word because it's in Virginia, or near North Carolina, uh, Virginia. But it was one of the most successful plantations in the south it was 100% run by African people. So it was a powerful group of people who got strong enough in this country to assert themselves as a family and keep there and, and amongst the local people have enough respect. Again, why did they have respect amongst the local people? Because the local people were not necessarily partial towards the English system. The local people might have looked more, I guess, what we call today white, but they could have been 
Native American people. And if they uh, kept any kind of, um, and a lot of times you had to keep little, little secrets, you know. You couldn't just go around saying, oh, I'm Native American, oh, I'm, oh, I'm black, oh, I'm, you know, <laughs> you just who you were. And you just stayed in your county, and you basically, as long as you was in that county, you was a free person. <laughs> That's kind of how it worked. And if you gotten and and if you left that county, you better have some paperwork to prove who you were. Whether whether you was Native American or if you was African, you better have something on you to prove that you are Native American and or African. And even then, there was a not lot of not a lot of people you could go to to argue that this person you know did this to you because you were. African or Native American. So you just basically had to steer clear of a lot of trouble. And a lot of times what happened was what people did locally was if there was a person what they call could pass that looked white. Because that's why it was important for some of them to want to marry a person who was white. Because that person could go into the to the city and sell the crops. Uh, you know, generally when they sold a crop, they sold it to a government man. They didn't sell a crop to, you know, just out on the street, you know, in a, in a wagon or something. You know, like we see like, a, you know, the food the food wagon show up and some guy with a little bell. It wasn't like that. There was generally a, a, a large crop, you know, a large crop. And there was, a, you know, a government official who would come get these crops and they would take it into the city, you know, wholesale. They would just wholesale buy these crops. And again, when we say government official, let's go ahead and say that these were the aristocracy, the ruling class people. Because again, they passed a law that a certain, you know, even amongst the English, certain um, English people could not deal with the Africans, nor could they deal with Native Americans who were farmers. So they were really trying to control the money. They was kind of trying to control who was going to get wealthy, and how, and how fast. And in order to do that, a certain group of people had, had ascended upon the government, had descended upon the government, taken over, because they had the population to get the votes. And what they did was they started changing the laws in their favor so that they could... Um, you know, uh, start changing the laws so they could start subjugating the people who was already here. So that began being to come more and more, um, they start becoming more and more um, normal. And so what happened over time was a lot of these people was running these counties and a lot of them, some people just forgot that they was native or even if they was black originally, <laughs> But African ancestry, they forgot. And they literally became white. <laughs> and then some of them didn't. You know, it really depended on, you know, just like everything else today is an individual decision. It really depended on the individuals who was doing this stuff. Uh, and, you know, what they were doing with their lands and um, how good of a business person they were. If they had descended into, um, you know, not getting educated properly, maybe the certain generation would, would lose the property after one generation had built it up. You know, I mean, there was a lot of things like that was going on. And what certain people was doing was, uh, you know, basically trying to maintain. That's essentially what they were doing. They were trying to maintain some sense of uh, what they originally had at all costs. Now, did these people start out to be Native Americans? Did they start out to be African? At some point, these identities began to get obscured. And again, the people lost track. Even the people who started calling themselves white eventually, they lost track of uh, who they originally were. <laughs> Because there was so much incentive, there was so much, there was so many advantages to being, to simply being a person of British origin. 
There was so many events. In other words, you can stay where you always were. You can keep all your property. You can make all this money that your family built up. And this, this wealth was passed down from one generation to the next. So what happened was it created a certain like a uh, caste. It created a system where if you looked like a British, and of course it was just a look, and what a lot of people could do, and, uh, and even people in my family who, these are the ones who eventually were no longer native, they were no longer African, they moved to West Virginia, Kentucky. For example, there's a name called Talia Farrow. You ever meet anybody named Talia Farrow? How you doing, cousin? That's my cousin. <laughs> they, they came in, I can tell you the ship they came in on in Jamestown. They came to Jamestown in 1635 on a ship called a Bonaventura, <laughs> along with my uh, ancestors from Scotland, who basically right away blended with the Native American people, <laughs> both groups. And the reason why the Tala Pharaohs, because this guy came over, he was from Italy. He was too brown. They were doing this casting system. And he was, he was from Venice even, but he was a little bit too brown. The British felt like, well, you, you can't be, you, you're too brown. You must be a native or you must be African, but you can't be, you can't marry any of our people. <laughs> Literally, that's what happened. So guess what? He took a wife up among somebody of, of color. And we don't know, but I guarantee you, some of you people out here might be last name Talaferro. And you might not even know this because a lot of times, like I say, these, these histories have forgotten. There's only certain families like mine, like me, who actually know exactly the story. And okay, I'm gonna give you another example. Booker T. Washington. Do anybody know what the T stands for? Talia Farrow, that comes from Venice. He got that name legit. His family originally, if you was to study Booker T, his family originally came from guess where? Virginia. The exact area we're talking about. Booker T. Washington is African. Yes, he tried to help African people, but he was Italian. He was from Venice. He was mixed with also African, and guess what? He was also mixed with Native. He's a good example of this whole story I just talked about. Booker T. Washington. So if you want to know what the average person that I'm talking about from this region and the Trail of Tears and what these people looked like that went to Oklahoma, some of them more native looking, some of them more African looking, some of them more white, blend, all kind of blends in the middle. They basically died in a forced walk on the way to Oklahoma. Now, the Native Americans today who call themselves the Cherokee are actually the, the Seneca Mocha. Now, the difference with the Cherokee is they left earlier. They started getting forced out the area earlier. And that's another small tribe of the Tsinicamokas. Now, you remember the Tsinicamokas is a confederation of multiple different tribes. One of which is my tribe, which is one of the most dominant tribes. That's the Maripanai. Then there's another dominant tribe called the Pamunkey, which is also one of my tribes because I'm family from both those tribes, actually. Because again, back then, they intermarried with each other. There wasn't that many natives left. So if you was going to keep any native blood, and then by this point, it wasn't native blood. It was, for the most part, a person who looked brown with long, wavy hair. <laughs> you know? If you look like that, you was a native. You know, and from Virginia. That's who you are. Because that's what the average person looked like by the time you get to... Uh, by the time you get to, uh, let's say, uh, by the time you get to about uh, the 1700s, that's what that's what it was. And so, um, so, um, and that's all of the people from the Tidewater region of Virginia. I don't care what they look like today. Uh, I would say that most of those people, they did a DNA test from that area. They're going to find out. I don't care if they call themselves white today or whatever. They're going to find a lot of uh, African-American blood up in them. <laughs> They're going to find some Native American blood in them. They're going to trace less back to, to Europe than they thought. They might trace a little bit to Europe or they might trace a lot to Europe. It really all depends on 
who their ancestor married back then, what, when, where, and how. And you know, and how the genes work, you know. Genes work the way they did, but I do know that uh, John Roth was not uh, all that great with uh, Matoa because he referred to her as a savage in his memoirs when he was in England. Who refers to their wife that they love as a savage? He said, well, you know, I feel bad that I've married this people, I married this savage woman. You know? And I really do believe that John Rock poisoned her. Because if you look at the records closely, and you can look at some historians. John Roth lost his first English wife in Bermuda before he even got here. She just up and died. There was a lot of women around these men who would just up and just die for no apparent reason. This one time they're really vibrant and living a tough uh, life, I guess, you know, because they were women on a on an expedition but the men was they would survive i mean all you got to do is be able to uh eat and live you know cook you know pocahontas had lived all this time or matoka had lived all this time um so the disease will kill you in within the first month or so of, of contact so i believe that matoka died simply because john rock poisoned her he just poisoned her because her, he had found out that, and that was one of the reasons to go back to the New World. He had found out that um, Wuhan Sanoka had died. He was already old. And he was the only reason for Matoaka. He was the only reason to keep, for her to stay alive. As long as she was alive, he was safe, and the colonies were safe. So what do you need with this woman well, you have very little in common with, and the only reason, and you're trying to keep a lie going. It was very hard for him to keep the lie going. In England, he saw how this was embarrassing to him in England. Again, he called the woman a savage. He was embarrassed by her. And he had to make, before the whole thing, the, the whole thing started to fall apart. Basically, on Matoaka's, um, on Matoaka's actions, she started to get ticked off with Captain John Smith, she started not like her situation in England. People started to become suspect. And before everything, and then also they're headed back to the New World. He had to get her the heck out of there. And so before everything could fall apart, before everything could fall apart, what he did was, he said, okay, her usefulness is over with. I don't have any real use for her anymore. <clears throat> so um, basically what I'm going to do is poison her. Because every time when they went on a cruise, somewhere mid-cruise, and it was just very convenient that at one, I mean, when a person gets sick and died, they don't just get sick in, a, in the amount of time it took you. So they boarded the ship. She was, she was not sick when they boarded the ship. Nobody mentioned that she was sick. Or maybe, perhaps she started to get sick, but I believe she was poisoned. But you put her on the ship. She's on the ship. And somewhere before you can get to pass, um, I, I forget what the landmark was, but they're going down this major river that they go down and leave uh, London. Before you can leave the shores of, of England, she's dead. Hold on, first of all, she gets on a ship, but before she can leave the shores of England, and you put her on the ship, everybody's thinking, Okay, she's going to be fine. She's going to make a 90-day voyage fine. And then the next thing you know, she's dead. That just don't seem, that don't seem logical at all. And then her last uh, words that she said, now again, all of this history is based on Captain John, not Captain John Roth, putting words in her mouth. And the words that he put in is, well, I might die, but at least my children liveth. And they could go on and basically do what I've done. Preserve the, 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 the English colony. <laughs> you know, preserve all of the white people who basically have enslaved me and captured me and raped me. Uh, 
I just, it, you know, and against their will. They held, held her against their will. Now, there's a story, again, that the, that the captors made up. This is none of the, she didn't write one word. She didn't write one word. The person who's doing all this writing is John Roth and Captain John Smith and various other people who are basically uh, not really her friends. These were not people that was qualified to mention her in a positive light. And they probably were the very people who had basically, you know, done all these things to her. I mean, there's periods of her life, her life uh, after she produced, a ch well, during the time when she was producing children, so so to speak, where nobody knew what was happening. All they know is that she was living somewhere near Chesterfield, Virginia, and uh, and some person was keeping her there, obviously against her will, secretly, far enough from Powhatan where Powhatan could not find her, where uh, Owan Sanoka or Apet Chicano, none of these people who desperately wanted, he wanted, desperately wanted his daughter back. He couldn't find her. Now, they made up a story that they did, her time was up. That's basically what John Roth said. When her time was up, Matoka decided that she'd rather stay with the colonies. She was mad with her dad because he took so long to come get her. So therefore, since he took so long to come get her, she'd just rather stay with a captive. And later, not, not before, later, she converts to Christianity wholeheartedly. But yet, when she went to England, she took her, um, her number one priest, native priest with her. Well, if she was really trying to be a, uh, if she was really trying to be a, uh, if she was really trying to be a, uh, a Christian, why would she bring the sun worshiping Native American priest with her to England as her confidant? I mean, those two, if you know anything about the religion, they don't necessarily blend. There's no way you can get the Native American concept and the Christian concept to agree with each other. One is based on this, this character called Jesus. The other one is based on Moshe Manuto. Nature. Nature. You know, nature is God. <laughs> you know, and one of the toughest aspects of nature is, guess what? The sun. That's one of the most obvious elements that you can see when you look up in the sky. So, uh, and also they had, uh, you know, eagle is a falcon. Eagle is a type of falcon. All of the, all the, all, all the um, colonials did was, they saw that the Native Americans, they had studied, by this point, uh, Egypt began to get studied. In Europe, and certain educated people, the same people who called her Pocahontas, which is Greek and Latin, Poca means little in Latin, and Hontas means whore in, in Greek. And uh, the same people that call her Pocahontas also realized that the Native Americans, one of the most sacred birds was the eagle. And then a short time after that, uh, let's say about 100 years later, I won't even say 100, let's say about 50 to 75 years later, when they're trying to design a country, these people were not even original enough to get their own iconography. They stole iconography from Egypt, and they stole iconography from the Native Americans. So the American eagle is Native American. It's a Native American concept. It is not a concept that they came up all by themselves with. Um, they basically came up with the studies of Egypt, which they blended with the studies of the Native American culture. So they were paying attention to the Native American culture. They was definitely paying some attention. They was paying attention to that. Um, and they was paying attention to the so-called pagan religion of the Native Americans, which again was based on 
the sun. I mean, and so, so um, <clears throat> what you had is you have um, you have um, so I don't know that uh, Matoaka. I don't know how Christian she was, and and so anybody who actually know. The Native Americans, see, if you don't know the Native Americans' perspective, you know that the whole story of her being a Christian is hogwash. Because it's no way you're going to have your own Native American priest with you, and at the same time, you're going to be a Christian. It's just those two things are in direct conflict. Direct, direct, direct conflict. And it's either got to be one way or the next. And you know how it is with the Christians. And she got Christianized in England. That's where she, that's where they thought enough for her to get Christianized. Where all of the, uh, all of the, the important um, ceremonies of Christianity happened. In England, when, when John Rolfe was trying to legitimize himself as an important family of the Americas as the aristocracy. Now he has a chance to go from a merchant status. That's basically what he was. He had a chance to go from a lowly, a lowly aristocrat, not a top aristocrat, a lowly aristocrat to a upper aristocrat status. And the way he was going to get there was by way of Matoaka. And by claiming that she had royal blood, and by him marrying her, therefore he is a royal of the new world. That's basically what his claim was. And they basically put him in a position where his family could marry into the royal families, into the, uh, the noble families of, of, of England. Because even in England, Captain John Smith kept telling Matoaka, um, I cannot talk to you. You're not on my station. You're above my station. And what Matoaka said to him was, all that time when you was with my father, and you were terrorizing my father. My father was in fear of you. All the natives of America was in fear of you. And you had no problems uh, attacking us and, 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 and jacking us up, basically. And now, and you didn't really respect me then, but now all of a sudden here, when I meet your, she, she actually met her as king, but she didn't meet the king in, a, in, a, in an official way. She met him in such a, a, a casual way. He didn't take her serious. He just wanted to see what a native looked like. And once, once uh, I believe it was King James, once King James saw what, the, what Matoaka looked like, okay, dismiss, bye. That was all to it. So there was no there was no reception of Matoaka as this that all that stuff was invented later where you have uh, Pocahontas uh, who was built up way after all these people died King James had died <laughs> um, and basically it was John Rolfe and his family even after John Rolfe has passed his family still he and, and he uh, remarried he remarried a white woman. <laughs> And the whole idea was for his family to be that's white now, including the one I think that could pass. The one that could pass is white stayed in England, I believe. But the only one that could pass, I mean, he felt like he could pass as long as he was in. I mean, I'm not going to say pass. He thought he was good as long as he was in the, in the Americas. Um, they really needed to prove themselves. They needed to prove themselves as the first family of, 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 of the Americas. And guess what? They went into government. They were some of the people who set up all these original slave laws. John Roth. They were some of the people who, uh, and they used uh, Thomas Roth, Matoaka's son, as just like they used Matoaka. She be he became famous after he died, simply because he was the first person, he was considered the first intermarried, intermarried, uh, the first child between the English 
and the natives. And he was considered the first legitimate heir to inherit, guess what? The whole state of Virginia. And so Matoaka may, I mean, and the native people after Opec, Ohan Sinoka died, way after Opec Chicano died, way after, uh, way after uh, Opec Chicano, all these people died and Matoaka died. The native people said, well, Matoaka was standing in a position to be, to inherit. I mean, perhaps Wuhan, could, Wuhan Sinoka had her in position to inherit everything because obviously she was supposed to be married to uh, another, another person. Uh, and that was Jekawa's son, Kahun, Kahun. That was her first person she was betrothed to. And what you don't understand with uh, Opec Chicano, the Powhatans could actually marry their cousins, or they could even marry their nieces, or they could marry their aunts, <laughs> because of the fact that the dominant man wanted to keep the kingship, he wanted to keep authority in his, make sure that he could keep it. So in other, for, in other words, say for example, you're a brother of the king, or if you're a, or if you're a uh, son of the king, uh, here's your sister, she's going to get everything. <laughs> you're not going to get anything, and you're this tough guy. So you don't want to marry your sister, but you can marry your, your, uh, your sister's cousin, or you can marry your sister's aunt, or somebody, somebody that's a little bit removed from you. I don't think you can actually marry your sister. I don't think they actually married their sister, but, you know, um, that was normal for the Tassina Kamoka to do because of the way the matriotic system worked. It was very normal for a dominant man like Opec Chicano to actually marry, uh, not necessarily his sister, but some anybody who is the descendant of of um, Matoka's mother. Anybody who was a descendant of her was a person of very importance because that was the bloodline of the original forefathers. For thousands of years uninterrupted. And that was very important.